And we're moving on to our next panel. It's going to just take a minute or so, I think, to complete the final uh, miking up of everybody on the panel. So just bear with us for a second. Um, and just to clarify, so staying in here for the tipping points session, if there's anybody who feels they should be at the innovation showcase and uh, learning about some of the really latest and most innovative startups in the space, now is the time to head downstairs. So I just want to make sure everybody is in the right space. Uh, and then we will be getting going shortly just as we uh, complete the miking up. Um, great. To make a maybe uh, a brief linkage uh, back to some of the conversations we had this morning, because I know actually a number of the panelists weren't with us all of the day, uh, but we did actually have uh, a really interesting question at the end of the data panel, just around some of the uh, results that come out of economic modeling, in particular, whether we might be undercooking, for want of a better word, some of the hothouse world scenarios uh, and the, the potential impact they might have on GDP. So um, it was, wasn't planted as a question, but it was perfectly placed, I think, to get into this conversation around tipping points and managing uncertainty. Uh, so on that note, uh, I'm going to head over, hand over to David Carlin, uh, who leads the work on UNEPFI. David, obviously, it's been wonderful to work together in many different uh, guises, uh, leads the work on climate risk. Um, and the panel is yours to take it from here, David. So many thanks for joining us. Great. Th thank you so much. It's, it's really great to be here, and it's uh, really nice to see a large number of familiar faces, collaborators, friends, um, folks that are, are all really working on some of these big global challenges together. And one of the things I think we'll talk about most in this session is how, from a risk perspective, but really also from a scientific perspective, some of these changes are unfolding in nonlinear ways. Different systems are, are reaching new states. And so what we're going to do is have um, a short presentation uh, from Professor Jason Lowe uh, talking about tipping points and talking about some of where the latest science stands. And then really the discussion over the course of the session will be about some of the latest work looking at, at where my, I uh, thought my mic went, uh, where, where the areas are of gaps in the financial community in terms of why we've seen stress test after stress test. A few weeks ago, the Fed stress test came out. Uh, and we see very modest and fairly expected results. We see that physical risks are growing in scenarios of warming. We see sectors that we expect to be most affected are most affected, but we're not really seeing the degree of impacts, and I think it's leaving a lot of people justifiably uneasy that we're missing something. And so what we'll be talking about is how some of those nonlinearities in the systems or tipping points, how those play in from a physical and transition risk standpoint, but we'll also really be talking about what both the communities, the scientific community and the financial community can do to both better understand, but also better provide the information needed in uh, moving forward on this. And so we are in a, a nonlinear age, and so we're looking at these challenges and trying to appreciate them as ones that are, as the famous Hemingway quote goes about going bankrupt, first slowly, then all at once, a lot of changes, whether it be about renewables deployments, whether it be about asset prices, or whether it be about physical systems, are exhibiting these behaviors increasingly so. And if we don't factor those things in, if we don't appreciate that we need those margins of safety to address them, we're going to find ourselves in a particularly chaotic environment. So with that, I'll um, have Professor Jason Lowe uh, share some of his perspectives on the uh, the current state of the science around tipping points and some of the challenges um, that we're confronting on a planetary basis. And then, as I said, we'll bring it back down to um, the financial implications. That's good. I managed to break the microphone in the process. So, Originally, the idea of this was just to put together a few slides to make sure we're all in a similar position when we, we start the discussion. And I realized when I put the, the slide together, and I was looking at these on the, the train on the way in, 
understanding Earth system tipping points for the finance sector. I kind of wish I'd put it the other way around. What we don't understand about Earth system tipping points for the finance sector, or more generally. I was also reflecting on one of the discussions this morning, and it struck me that when we talk about Earth system tipping points, we also need to put that into perspective. Many of them are certainly high impact events, but many of them still remain low likelihood. And there are many changes in the climate system that will also cause severe damage, other than tipping points, that are actually high likelihood or very high likelihood. And so when we think of tipping points, we need to picture that, um, that broader um, system of potential damage. So what are Earth system tipping points? Um, there are many diagrams that illustrate some of the, the common thresholds or tipping points in the system. Here I'm quoting from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, sixth assessment, and they define a tipping point as a critical threshold beyond which a system reorganizes, often abruptly and or irreversibility, irreversibly. The map shows some of the examples that we might think of when it comes to tipping elements in the climate system. So let's just take a, a, a few of these. Um, the ones in blue, they represent the cryosphere, so they represent ice um, and typically the loss of ice. The ones in red, they represent circulation changes, whether it's atmosphere or ocean. And the ones in green, they really represent the biosphere and changes, for instance, in, in vegetation. So one that's been studied very much in the cryosphere is the Greenland ice sheet. The Greenland ice sheet, were we to take all of the ice from that, melt it and spread it over the ocean, it would raise sea level by around seven meters in total. There have been a whole host of studies going back um, certainly two decades, trying to understand using models um, what a threshold might be for pushing Greenland into irreversible deglaciation. We're getting closer to understanding the physical mechanisms, but there's still a lot of uncertainty around the precise trigger conditions. We could take an example of the Atlantic overturning circulation. Now this is part of a large scale global ocean circulation and it transports a very significant fraction of the heat that's moved from the tropics to high latitudes, and so it has a very big impact on weather in Europe and throughout the Northern Hemisphere. We also could take an example of the Amazon forest and potential dieback of that forest. The Amazon forest stores a very large fraction of the world's vegetation carbon, around 20% or so, and loss of the Amazon forest, um, not only would it potentially release some of that carbon back into the atmosphere, but it wouldn't be there as a significant sink for carbon. So all of these have potential thresholds related to either abrupt changes in the case of uh, the Atlantic overturning circulation, irreversible in the case of the loss of the Greenland ice sheet, or in the case of Amazon, I think of that as an amplifier of change because it would result in extra carbon in the atmosphere. So, what do we know? I'm going to go through four things, and these are, these are my personal view. So, firstly, there are many studies that now examine the trigger conditions, trigger points. And I'm just showing a graphic from an excellent paper produced by the, the group in Exeter, uh, this one by David Armstrong McKay. Um, and it compiles the results from earlier studies um, and shows information on the potential temperature trigger. There's a problem, though. Although we can bring these studies together, it still doesn't really give us a robust estimate of the likelihood of triggering the, uh, the, the, the various tipping points. This is also made more, um, more severe when we think of potential futures that are overshoot futures. So it may well be, when we look in a, a range of low emission scenarios, that actually the temperature rises to a peak, but then with negative emissions, the temperature may be brought down again. So what is the temporary resilience during that overshoot period of the different thresholds that we've seen here? We don't know that yet. There are a number of studies attempting to advance 
um, our understanding, but it still remains a gap to really robustly understand the likelihood. We do increasingly understand some of the physical mechanisms, and this comes from a mix of observations, paleo records, and models. There are gaps in the understanding, but increasingly it's pointing towards um, indicators of early warning of change. And it holds the promise of being able to better understand when a tipping point is being approached. And also, I think it helps us understand the transition time. So when a tipping point is triggered, when do we actually feel the consequence of that? We also have an increasing ability to simulate the potential impacts of tipping points. So we can trigger them artificially in models, remembering that the model is not a, a real world, but it's giving us useful information, hopefully, about the real world. And we can start to study impacts, whether they're physical impacts like temperature, rainfall, etc. And the plot here, this is showing a temperature response following a, an AMOC collapse with cooling over much of the, the northern hemisphere. We need now to take more of those studies through to societal relevant impacts. And that's starting to happen, for instance, um, in areas such as heating demand, wind power, and agriculture. So that will help provide additional information for adaptation. The fourth one is that there's incredible concern over tipping point cascades. So you could consider an example here where water from the melting of the Greenland ice sheets affects the Atlantic overturning circulation. That, in turn, affects the intertropical conversion zone and temperatures and rainfall in the tropics, further impacting the Amazon forest. That, in turn, provides an amplifying factor um, via reduced uptake of CO2 and release of further CO2 into the atmosphere. The extra water from Greenland can also act as a destabilizing effect on the West Antarctic ice sheet. So we're starting to understand the potential coupling, but at the moment we can't put a magnitude reliably onto that coupling, and that's one of the research challenges we'll see. And then finally, I just wanted to put the other side of the coin, that maybe we need to look beyond Earth system tipping points. For instance, we may have seen a tipping point in um, public opinion in terms of understanding climate change, and instead of thinking of it just as something in the future, recognizing it's already here. There may be tipping points in terms of behavior, be it traveling for work, for instance, or dietary changes. And there may be tipping points in prices of particular technologies that lead to a shift in their uptake. I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you. So I, I think that that's a really great framing. And, and of course, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, as, as you heard, but also a, a huge amount of, of risk and need to prepare for that. And, and I think to start things off, I'll, I'll go to, to Catherine first and really say from what you've heard in the physical systems, not just um, now, but over the last several years around research, where do you see some of these tipping points having effects in terms of physical and transition risks, in terms of markets and asset pricing? How are you thinking about that, uh, either organizationally or just across the, uh, the market? Well, thank you very much um, for that deep and big question. I, I think I want to answer it in two parts, if I could, going back to what Jason said earlier. So I'm Kath Bremner, I'm at Impacts Asset Management, but I'm also currently co-chairing the Climate Finance Risk Forum with Ingrid Holmes on adaptation. And so for the last six to nine months, a lot of the finance sector have been thinking about adaptation, and Jason actually has been providing us advice. Um, two parts. So in terms of tipping points itself, um, as Jason said, we still don't know a lot of the detail about how they'll impact. So when we're looking at supply chain risks, it seems so far in the future. One of the things that we've seen in this adaptation working group is actually what the finance sector need are three things. First is they need to understand that transition plans now need to include adaptation. So a net zero plan is an adapted plan because we're at 1.26 degrees. And as Jason said, we might overshoot 1.5 and what does that mean? So we need to achieve net zero. It's not an either or, it's an and. 
The second thing is, um, and we've been talking about this a lot, is we need better local hazard data and understanding of tail risk. And within that context in the UK, you know, insurers, when you get a mortgage, you have your, your, your flood insurance, you have to have your insurance to get a mortgage on year one. If year two, your house floods and you don't get insurance for that year, we don't know yet whether that mortgage is covered. So there's still, you know, when we do stress testing and we're looking at, there's still gaps in data and sharing between different parts of the finance sector, but also understanding the tail risk of those local hazards, which we're already experiencing today. And then the third thing as an asset manager, which impacts is when we look at supply chain risks of the portfolio companies we're in, whether that's, you know, if you look at drought risk or deforestation, um, what we don't have is very good asset level data. So we invest at a company level, so you might invest in a Siemens stock, but they have, you know, 250 of manufacturing plants globally. Do we know really, do that, does that company have a good adaptation plan? So from our perspective, I think risk assessment needs to include local geo-specific data on where locations of assets are. Yeah, I, th I think that those are, those are great points, Catherine. And the, and the fact is that there are a lot of data gaps. There's a lot of uncertainty. I also think there's a bit of a, a, a paradigm shift that needs to take place amongst many that are either conducting some of these exercises, building some of the uh, models that are being used for that assessment, and, and thinking about how those pieces really come together. because. On the one hand, it's not just about likelihood, but also about what is the potential impact and are we prepared in circumstances up to, up to that. And I actually think that that's a really good um, segue for, for Oliver to talk about some of the work. Um, there was a groundbreaking paper that the IFOA put out called the Climate Scorpion talking about some of these challenges and the fact that this sting really is, as the scorpion is, in the tail. And so, I'll let him share not only some insights from, from that work and that ongoing uh, work which continues, uh, but, but how do you see this uh, as a need for the paradigm to shift when considering this for insurance, considering this for the, the broader financial sector? Thanks, David. So, yeah, um, as David mentioned, so I recently co-authored a report called Climate Scorpion, the Sting is in the Tail. Um, so you can, uh, you can Google that. So this was a collaboration between some actuaries working across insurance, asset management, um, consulting, and the public sector, and scientists at uh, Cambridge and Exeter University, including Professor Tim Lenton, who's a well-known expert on tipping points. Um, and it's, the report is about the, the tail risk from climate change, so in other words, the risk that, that the actual outcome is, is worse than the best estimate in the IPCC reports. So I'm just going to pick out that... Um, three key points from the report. Um, the first one is just the difference between uh, climate, uh, between science and risk management approaches. Um, the second one is talking about the risk of climate sensitivity being on the high side. And the third one is the risk of if we overshoot, as Jason was talking about, overshoot one and a half degrees Celsius target, um, and, uh, and we don't get back below that in enough time. Um, and then I'll briefly talk, touch on the uh, impacts on the financial sector and stress testing and, and positive tipping points, but we might pick up on that later in the discussion. So, so firstly, the, what's the difference between um, science and risk management? Well, science is a search for what the, the answer is, the best estimate. Risk management fundamentally is about asking what's a realistic worst case scenario, how bad can it get? Um, and obviously for a risk like climate change, there's no, globally, there's no diversification. So it kind of makes intuitive sense to base your policy on avoiding the, the worst case scenario. Um, so second point is the, the risk of sensitivity of the climate being on the high side. So climate sensitivity is a shorthand for the amount of the earth warms up for any given amount of greenhouse gas. And it's normally defined in terms of the, the, what warming you ultimately get if you double the carbon dioxide concentration from the pre-industrial level. So the, the IPCC have a best estimate of climate sensitivity of three degrees Celsius for doubling CO2. 
But they also say, and this is in the latest report, um, that there is an 18% chance of climate sensitivity being higher than 4.5 degrees Celsius. So that's actually more than one in six, which is higher than your chance of losing at, at Russian roulette. So um, what if that sensitivity is on the high side? So if it is, it's probably the case that carbon budgets are already negative already. Um, and then thirdly, what's the risk if we overshoot one half degrees Celsius? Well, um, so, so Jason was talking about these tipping points. There's research that in, seems to indicate uh, that they triggered maybe, a, some of them are triggered at lower temperatures than we previously thought, um, like Greenland ice sheet, for example, and also that they are somehow connected, and if you trigger one, they're more likely to trigger others. So the risk of going above one and a half degrees is, seems to be higher than we previously thought. And you also, when you take a risk view, you have to look holistically, systemically, at, at cost cascading and, and compounding risks, otherwise you don't pick up the full, um, full risk in total. Um, so I see it as maybe a bit like going overshooting the temperature target. You can look at it as a bit like when you're climbing Mount Everest. So if you go above a certain altitude, you're okay for you can be okay for a while. Um, we don't know how long that's going to be, but you, you have to come down again. Um, so we need very large negative emissions in the future. That's clear. Possibly other actions to hold temperature down in the meantime. Um, so David King talked about that recently. So just to, just to finish off, I, I think um, we need a, a realistic risk assessment of climate change that takes into account all the risks and uncertainties, including tipping points. We're actually doing this now as a follow-up to a project called Planetary Solvency. Um, we should be looking into the damage function for climate change, which uh, that affects the climate stress test. We might pick up on it later. And, and there, there should be a lot more... Um, education about positive tipping points in the economic system because there is a huge uh, um, opportunity for more rapid change than, than most people realize. I, I think that the, the points that, that you brought up are, are really good ones and you mentioned at the end about stress testing and, and in, in doing so, we've seen since 2020 climate stress tests that have been conducted in now, I think, over three dozen jurisdictions around the world. What we've tended to find have been fairly standard results on, on both the physical and transition side. Typically, these are, are assessed separately, but sectors that we would intuitively believe to have higher transition risks, oil and gas, um, and high emitting sectors see higher losses areas that are more susceptible to flooding, um, industries like agriculture tend to be more affected on the physical side, but we haven't really gotten to that showstopper. And I think from my experience in, in building some physical risk models, what we've tried to see is a lot of work around, well, what if we look at a higher emissions pathway or what if we bring forward some of those expected damages, but all of these are still very much taking a linear based approach and, and just trying to port it forward, kind of changing the slope of the line, not really thinking about those discontinuities. And so the thing I'd like to open up to the, the full group to, to chat about here is, what do you see in these stress tests? What have been the beneficial learnings? Where are they, and perhaps more importantly, why are they falling short uh, in terms of getting to this, either this big impact or this meaningful impact that is Really answering the question of tell me something I don't know. <laughs> not to be not to be too, too negative about it, but but I think that that is if if you can look at the exercise and already say I can rank order which areas which sectors are going to be in a certain way. Some, somebody from one of the central banks lamented to me. I think this was more of an exercise in assessing which providers used which methodologies than it was in the risks within. The, the books that they were assessing. So with a number of those shortcomings, a number of those challenges, what do you see as some of the benefits of current stress testing and why do you see it falling short in terms of where it could be? Yeah, um, so, Oliver, do you wanna start? I, I think it's great that at least we're doing it, right? So we did, this is very different from a few years ago. So we're doing stress tests on, on climate change and, and they can be improved and should be improved in the future. 
I think at the moment, from what I've seen, um, is that they fall really far short of what, what a stress test should be, because it should be, it should be looking not at the, the, the most likely outcome, but, but the, you know, something in the tail. And they really don't do that. The hop house earth scenario results that I've seen, I mean, you look at it and you think, well, climate change isn't that bad, really. You know, <laughs> that's not what you, want, you expect to see. Yeah, Catherine. I, I was going to give you a few examples of a live stress test. I used to work for a major um, bank in Australia, and one of our biggest institutional clients was a mining company. I won't tell you which one, but there are only a few that are really big. And in 2010, they had um, the floods in Queensland, and this particular mining company couldn't get pumps big enough to pump the water out of the coal mines. And so their working capital facility, which was 30 days, they're about to go bankrupt globally. And we had to extend it to 90 days. And so when you're doing a stress test of one of the major clients of the bank, I don't think we'd really thought about the cascading impact of the fact that flood was all across Queensland. You couldn't get pumps for love nor money globally into the state at that point. So when I think about stress tests, it's really interesting to start to consider not only single assets but or single companies, but the compounding impact of an event, which is your tail risk. And if you think about the heat wave in the UK um, a few years ago, if you remember, it was 40 degrees and 35. You know, we had 16,000 days, school days lost over those three weeks in the UK. The train lines had to shut down because the electric wires were bending to touch the trains, which isn't good from a safety perspective, you know. So is the UK infrastructure prepared to deal with summers? And the report that, you know, we'll be hopefully releasing not too distant will show some of these case studies in the UK context, but also internationally, that shows as when you're looking at stress tests, what is the chance of a asset failure or an infrastructure failure at that point. And yeah. I think that's maybe the start, you know, not only the value at risk, but what's the chance of that happening? Where asset values might go to zero or completely change as a consequence of that event happening. Yeah, yeah Nick. Cool. Thank you much. Um, maybe I should introduce myself. So so my name's Andrew Wilkshire and I'm actually a climate modeler. So on the finance side, I'm really am yeah, I'm thin on the ground there. But but really what I was gonna pick up on the on the point here is is actually maybe we need to be better job, doing a better job of understanding what those hazards really are from, from, from climate change. And we've talked about you know, dipping into the, into the tails. We're, we're very good at looking and pointing towards what may be the median most likely outcome, but we do need to look at uh, those tails and really understand what, what, what they, they look like and the impacts. And you know, we've, we've seen things in the UK, we talked about wildfire in the UK. Now, you know, these are the kind of quite extreme impacts that, that we weren't really uh, necessarily expecting. You see, you see them in the in the climate models and projections, but we do actually have to look. And I think we're we maybe focused a little bit on the most likely, but we do need to look at those tails in more detail. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that comes across also is when we think about stress testing, that point that these do need to be stressful scenarios. They need to be ones that a, a firm has the resiliency to manage, not ones that are potential pathways that are most likely or ones that are attenuated by, by missing some elements, which I think is, is a good point to, to bring up and ask you, Jason, about when it comes to these tipping points that, that you had presented on and that we've been talking about, what is finance missing here? What is, what is the kind of missing piece, whether you're a regulator designing a stress test, whether you're a risk manager building a model, whether you're someone who is trying to work on the business line and consider their client. From, from the science community, what, where, what are the messages that aren't really coming through um, as you see it for finance? So, I mean, I, I, I don't see it in such a, a kind of a binary way, a, a conversation like that. I think what, what I found really exciting when talking more and more to the, the finance sector and colleagues in the finance sector is that we're bringing more and different disciplines onto this problem of the climate challenge. And I think that's absolutely essential. Now, there are some common factors that keep coming up, and I think these are areas where we all need to, 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 to work on whether we're coming at it from the background of finance or the background of, of, of climate science, like, like Andrew said. 
So one of them is putting more focus on the present day. Um, we tended to focus very much on long-term climate change, but trying to understand what's happening um, tomorrow or next week or next month and understanding the envelope of potential outcomes we may get in the near future is something that I think we can improve on. I think understanding the interaction of natural variability with the long-term trend is something that we can, we can probably do better. Um, I think specifically around tipping points, um, there is often this focus on the likelihood question. And that's really difficult to, to, to narrow down. But there are other useful things that we already do know, perhaps better around tipping points, and recognising how we might use those in decision making in the finance sector, I think is an area that uh, probably needs, needs further work as well. Um, I think there's also this idea of um, perhaps appreciating a little bit better um, how the tools that are used for risk assessment in the finance sector can actually be brought into climate studies. And something that I've, I've been working on with, with, with colleagues is, for instance, how we can better learn from catastrophe modeling when thinking about adaptation. And so it has to be a two-way dialogue, and you have to be in it for the long term. Um, but those are, those are probably some of the starting points I would pick. I, I think that that is, is really important to think about the dynamic between finance and, and the scientific community, and, and not only a, a sense of mutual understanding, some of the work that one of, um, one of my project teams has been doing with UNEP-FI has been working with the NGFS to connect the modelers, the supervisors, and the financial users to really say sector by sector, what are we seeing? What are your analysts saying? How are these things connecting or not? And I think that that's really important. One of the things that, that came up at the beginning, and, and Catherine brought it up, was around this data need. And I think a lot of, a lot of information is out there and now is being synthesized, we're still gonna have blind spots. And in some cases, I'm often one to push the brakes a little bit on, on being too data focused with the idea that fundamentally finance is always about uncertainty. If we knew with any definitive sense who would default, whose assets would rise in value, who would be likely to file a claim, then the entire nature of risk management would be, be obsolete. And yet, we, we operate in a world of uncertainty and so, Better data gives us more of that picture, but I, I really like this notion of the, the minimum viable prediction. What is the piece of information that improves your, your information, your informational capacity? And I think it's a, a good question um, to ask Andy as well about what can the climate science community do in terms of data, in terms of the data streams, useful um, aggregation, what are some of the practical methods that, that you see for, for providing that data to decision makers in finance, whether those be private sector actors or, uh, or their regulators. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, David. Um, so maybe I've already touched on, on one of those points, this idea of, of about being able to share that, that uncertain uh, distribution we have around uh, what we may consider the, the, the most likely uh, temperature prediction. But as, as Jason was showing, that we do miss some of these things, particularly around, around the tipping points. These are quite, uh, low likelihood uh, events, and we have low confidence in them, and we, we don't necessarily have the, um, all, all the right tools and things ready to put together to understand those. So I think, I think what we do need to do, we need to bring that uh, into, into this framework. So I think we can probably do work here where we, where we understand what the um, consequences of, uh, of these tipping points, if they do occur. We, we should, saw an example there, a temperature um, plot from what might happen if, if we had an AMOC uh, uh, severe slowdown, uh, for instance. Um, so that's really about sort of understanding consequences, the, the impacts there. Um, Jason also touched on about early warning, and uh, I think that's, that, that's really useful. And actually what, what I think could be really useful here is we actually move forward and, and try to understand what would we do in those kind of uh, situations? What does that mean for, for, for asset management and that sort of things if we are uh, we have the, we are looking or standing on a, a sort of precipice of, of potentially a, a, what could be a quite a catastrophic change. So what would we do? How would we act in there? What would that mean for, for asset management and things? So I think that would be a, um, a really useful way that the communities can come together and, and, and hopefully really make some progress in these big topics. Yeah, I, I think that, that 
convening, and, and it's something that I see here with CGFI and, and I think is incredibly important, is bringing a number of those perspectives together because I, I think, in, and you saw in, um, in, in some of the slides Jason was presenting about different types of tipping points, that these are systems that are interlinked. I, I was thinking of that last page on the physical side, but going back a page before that, the economic systems are going to have dependencies on physical systems. Physical systems are gonna have dependencies on political choices that are made. And, and so we, we, we do need that, that interdisciplinarity in, within the room. One of the things that I was thinking about though is if we're at this somewhat beginning point of beginning to understand and, and appreciate the implications of these tipping points, perhaps for, for Oliver and, and for Catherine as well, what are you seeing either within your um, within organizations that you work with um, in-house and, and across the industry? How are you seeing financial institutions beginning to consider tipping points, begin integrating some of these insights of, of tail risk and, and non-linearity into either models for engagement, models for risk management, models for capital provision, um, any any examples as well as what you see potentially as a target state, if you'd like. So, uh, I, I, um, whoever would like to go first. Um, so, Impact Asset Management in 2018 um, created its adaptation taxonomy um, for our climate strategy. And what we looked at at the time was a primary and secondary adaptation. So, primary, so, you know, where's the opportunity for solution providers to provide adaptation solutions to address you know, the challenges we've got. And primary adaptation, everyone talks about flood risk and cooling systems and better engineering. We're at the ICE today, it's very relevant, I think, within this context. You know, lots of engineering solutions. But secondary might be you know, um, pharmaceuticals that can deal with high and low temperatures that don't need refrigeration. So there are also secondary adaptation. And one of the things we're seeing, certainly um, through the climate adaptation um, working group at the moment, is quite a lot of new taxonomies have been developed in the last 12 months by other asset managers, by um, EBRD, um, Climate Bonds Initiative. So I think, if you like, increasing the investment and deal flow in this area. So it's not just about having better data on how to manage adaptation, but people are now seeing this as you know, the risk involves an opportunity for investment. And I know you and FFI have been looking at this as well with the, um, your members as well. So I think part of it is creating the taxonomy or unlike mitigation, so we know in energy what we need to do for mitigation and we know electric vehicles and transport. We don't have a playbook for adaptation and tipping points that says in this sector, these are the five or top 10 measures. And in this sector, these are the top five or 10 measures. So. One of the things that I think we're starting to do is say there's investment opportunity and adaptation. It isn't all about risk mitigation as well. So I think that's one of the things that we're starting to do, as well as that, trying to enhance our risk assessment by having better hazard and asset level data. And I think that is really key as well. Yeah, so um, I, I work in the non-life insurance sector and obviously uh, the business of insurance is taking on risk, so it's absolutely core to, to monitor and manage risk, and particularly accumulations and extreme risk to, to make sure you survive. Um, but, and, 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 it, to, and obviously as climate change is changing, the risk of extreme weather events and hurricanes and so on, uh, it's, it's critical to keep up to date with that. Um, but when it comes to tipping points, it's an interesting one because um, if we, when, if we hit uh, one or more of these tipping points, so for, for example, the Atlantic overturning circulation, you get very, very big effects in, in the whole world. You get effects locally, but then changes in rainfall patterns in different places and probably effects on the food supply and, and so on. Um, and that's almost like not a business risk, so it's, um, it's sort of like proverbial asteroid Right, so it comes in and smashes everything up, and you can't you can't uh, mitigate that risk as an individual company. So what do you do? Well, I mean, you, you should be thinking about it on a systemic on a systems view, and saying we must not cross that boundary. And then it's up to the regulators and government policy to deal with that. So each individual company should be thinking about that and lobbying and uh, telling the regulators that we we must avoid these tipping points. So I think that's 
probably um, yeah what I'd say about that. Yeah, of course. Can I throw something in? Sure. So something that I think is sometimes missing from a question like that is the idea of trade-offs and co-benefits. And Kath, I think you were starting to hint at that with the, the investment opportunity around adaptation. Um, but I, I wonder if we could just get a view as to, to whether more perhaps needs to be done in terms of thinking of co-benefits at, um, at a company level, for instance. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've often said this. When you're building a net zero building, you should think about adaptation. Like, you don't make that investment once if you're doing a retrofit. You make it, you make it once. So if you're, if you're retrofitting a building with more insulation, think about the 40 degrees in London. You know, I, so I, I do think the co-benefits piece, and nature increasingly is important in this. Um, the London Resilience Review being led by Emma Howard Boyd, I think we'll talk about the fact some of the biggest flood risk in London is to do with the, um, the tubes and runoff from cemented, cemented paths and cemented houses now. And, and part of that's a skill set issue, actually, in that the people that put the um, cement back don't know how to plant trees. <laughs> They're not the experts. But if you look at, the, there's an, and I think a Dentum Council has employed people to put, put in place these barriers with trees and shrubs and it stops the flooding and runoff. And it's not very expensive. So I think we don't often talk in rounded terms in policy about co-benefits. It also changes the temperature, it improves, it reduces crime. It's all kind of these other co-benefits that you get when you look holistically at this problem. I, I think the, the need for those co-benefits is, is increasingly clear. We, we've seen with a lot of the carbon blinders that many of these solutions that are simply a replacement of one problem for another are ones that won't actually get us closer to a overall sustainable solution. When I think about sustainability, I think one of the key elements of it is that ability to continue on as, as you're, you are, and very little in that definition is presently sustainable and almost everything requires adaptation and change. And so when it comes to thinking about replacing fleets of internal combustion engines with electric vehicles, what are the implications of that when it comes to changing how we think about agriculture? What are the ways that we do that in responsible and um, equitable ways? What are the questions that arise around the social pressures? And I think a lot of this conversation on tipping points very much centers back to the fact that systems are related and that when we consider interlinked tipping points, we also need to be thinking about connected co-benefits and, and trying to do a bit of this multi-solving, approaching this not just as a single problem with a linear solution, but one that, that may have somewhat of an exponential and, and variegated solution. And that, I think, brings me to the final question before we open it to, uh, to the audience for, for their questions, which is, on the flip side of some of this, when it comes to changes you're seeing in terms of political sentiment, whether it's changes in social policy, whether it's changes in technology, where do you see some of the positive tipping points and, and how do you think about the way that financial actors should understand and embrace those and integrate them as well into their, their thinking? I might skip a policy question on the uh, PERDA thing, if that's all right. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> So I might pass that on. <laughs> yeah, sure. Can I have a go? So um, I would recommend everyone, uh, there's, there was a book came out a while ago called Five Times Faster by um, Simon Sharp. He used to work for the UK government. And he, was, he writes about the, the politics of climate change and also the economics of it. And there is, um, and it's based on the understanding that the economy is a complex adaptive system uh, which is a more modern way of thinking about it in terms of the economic theory. And like, like the, uh, the, the climate, so it's a complex system, which means that the economy has tipping points in it, which means that um, you can get a non-linear response. So you can have a relatively small uh, intervention in the economy, but if you put it in the right place at the right time, you can get huge change. And there are some, we already have some examples of that, like um, the UK offshore wind industry, for example. So there was a period, it needed subsidy in the beginning, but there was enough 
government support in the beginning, and it got it to the point where, with economy of scale, it became self-sustaining. It doesn't need subsidy anymore, and it's a massive success story in growth industry. So there are, other, there are going to be many other examples of that, but from the understanding, from this more modern understanding of the economy, and it's a, it's a hugely positive story that, that people should, uh, should know more about. Yeah. Any other positive words before we open it up for the audience? I mean, the only thing I would say is I think to, to Jason's earlier point, you need not just good, the scientists and the finance sector, you need the policy makers, local planning. And, and I do think the engineering side of this to all come together. So that multidisciplinary approach is key. I also think when you're dealing with adaptation or tipping points, you are talking a lot of time about systemic change. And I couldn't agree more with you. I think it's very hard for one financial institution to look at those systemic risks. But if you get a group of them together, like we've been lucky enough to do through the adaptation working group, we've had the insurance sector, the banking sector, um, you know, the asset managers, that full chain, as well as brought in expertise from Oxford University, from Leeds and that office. I think that's really helpful. And the regulators and government listening there, because then you can go, OK, we've got this problem. What are we all learning about it? Where do we see the gaps? And a very basic thing we did is a survey. What data do you need? <laughs> Where do you have the gaps? And so I think there is almost a baseline of understanding that we can build from that's really important. Um, and, you know, thanks to Matt and all the support that we've got throughout this process because I think, I think it's really needed. And, and, you know, Nicola Ranger and her team as well have been terrific in that regard. So I think we, we have time for a few audience questions. Uh, I'll start in the front. Thanks, is this, uh, my question is, am I telling you something you don't know? I suspect you do know that the name they all admitted. Building on Catherine's water pumps, stress tests don't work. Do you know that the Bank of England did a stress test in 2018, but our Prime Minister managed to break the Bank of England's financial stress test because it didn't go above 100 bips, and our Prime Minister gave us 130 bips very quickly. So stress tests don't work. Stress tests are only a regulatory enterprise. We actually need opportunity, boards and companies. The biggest tipping point, which we've not spoken about today, is the tipping point that will arise, I suggest, this is for comments, when financial markets reprice risk rapidly because governments have given finance a task it is not able to do, and this is the, do you know, finance has been bamboozled by economics. If finance ignores risk, I think I say to the economists there is no supply, so price discovery doesn't work, that's the problem with the NGFS scenarios and the CBES scenarios. So the fundamental problem, I suggest, is that mainstream economics has bamboozled finance and we, get, we need to get to uncertainty rather quickly because price doesn't work. Is that something you know? Question. <laughs> I think it's a little bit of a, <laughs> a leading question as the, the, the legal um, term would go. I, I, I think we, we have seen the limitations of, of these stress testing approaches. And I think part of this is what can we do to prepare? And, and there's an element I think that has been lost in some cases, but, but is coming back through, through I think a lot of hard work both from supervisors and others of creativity. There needs to be a, a bit of open-minded thinking of how these pieces fit together. And I think the, the exercise of, of having them fit together is itself valuable. But I think we should also be very cognizant that we're not getting a clean bill of health. I, I sometimes like in a stress test or any of these exams to someone using a reflex hammer and then sending you home from your, your physical and saying, well, you haven't checked my eyes or ears or heart or lungs or, or anything. And so it's not that the reflex hammer is useless. It's that if you take home the message that you're healthy because you've you know, been hit on the knee with it, that I think is, is where the mistake falls. 
but I'd be um, interested maybe to take, I think we have time for probably about two more questions for, you know, for my co-panelists. Um, I'll go to um, woman here, yeah. Thank you. I just would like to press on the issue around pricing because it's very important. I'm very sorry. First of all, I want to say I'm a fellow mathematician. I understand risk and stress risk and high level risk and those scenarios, and that's great. But shouldn't be this conversation. And, you know, because every time I come to this panel, I hear banks kind of waiting for somebody to tell them, oh, we know everything and we'll tell you what is going to happen. Shouldn't you guys, insurance and banks, have a more proactive approach and say, okay, we don't know everything, but we know that, you know, carbon is bad uh, and we are going to price um, you know, severely when we give loans and bonds uh, to, you know, heavy emitters rather than simply disinvest and kind of having a pricing attitude. So whereby, you know, we are pricing polluters and we are kind of, you know, uh, rewarding greener, activities. I fully understand you don't have the data. I fully understand there are a lot of gray areas, but there are places where those areas are not green. And if you look at data from the climate bonds or other bonds or green bonds, actually there is no evidence of renew, right? Despite what has been claimed, there is no evidence that the market is actually today uh, giving better rates to green investment as opposed to not green investment. So couldn't the banks take a much more direct approach and say, okay, exactly in the same way which we price credit, we are going to price polluters. Wouldn't that be a good forward step rather than waiting for policy to get together, to have some certainty, understanding the tipping points. Surely the tipping points sh should tell us that there is an urgency and you don't need to know everything to act, right? Shouldn't that be the lesson we learned here, because if we reach the point where we get the the ice the ice climbing, the, the ice melting, sorry, then we are completely, you know, there is nothing we can do. That risk is not me, not cannot be mitigated. Question point, a little pro provocative, but allow me to do that in a kind of friendly way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, any any thoughts around how how we evaluate risk and and where where carbon fits fits into that? So, I mean, I I agree with the sentiment of the question completely. But um, what each individual financial institution does is, for a very large extent, determined by the market. Because if they don't um, if they do something completely different, they, they, they won't survive, they won't get any business. And, and I think it's a, you know, this is a systems problem, it's a market problem, and it needs regulators to step in. And there should be a price on carbon. Uh, uh, that, that, that would be a good start um, to more differentiate. I mean, there, it is also true to say that uh, insurance companies are taking action. They're cutting back on the... Or, some of them, many of them are cutting back on the insurance of fossil fuel business. But it's also the case that other, other insurance companies are still doing it and they're taking, taking on that business. So again, it's a systems problem, I think, needs, needs a, um, a systems answer and a policy answer. Maybe a, a final question from the audience. I'm trying to choose carefully now. Already, already been burned twice. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, I'll shout for that. A couple of observations, but I'll, I'll, I'll be nice. Uh, one was political risk, I guess, is, a, is the big risk at tipping points. I, I'm not a finance expert by any stretch of the imagination, but it seems like in 2008 the politicians made the right political decisions and that, that sort of stopped contagion. There's definitely in climate change there's no guarantee if there's a food if there's a sort of series of food correlated price spikes the, the, the politicians won't make decisions that make make the situation a lot worse so that that I guess is a risk that I don't think we can probably model but it's a risk that feels like it's missing and then very quickly I'm not sure why we're talking about overshooting because we're not going to come back down once we've been up but I won't won't expand on that point. <laughs> Any final, final thoughts, panel? <laughs>
I mean, from, from, from my perspective, it's, it, it's, I guess it's this view of thinking as a system that I think we've all kind of come to this from, from different directions. Um, there is another part of that system, another skill set, and that's around ethics as well. And I think we, we've heard questions uh, that, that, that take us in that direction, which are also really important. Um, but I think what also really comes across is there are approaches to uh, being able to, to handle deep uncertainty. And we see them in different disciplines. And it feels like, to some extent, we're actually quite early in the, in the journey of doing that uh, with, with this community. And it's actually great to actually hear so many ideas. So thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any, any, any last thoughts, Catherine, Andy, Oliver? I mean, I just re-emphasize, I think um, you have to start somewhere. And I think when we're doing transition plans, they need to now include adaptation. Um, that we are experiencing climate change. And one of the things we've learned, certainly through the adaptation working group, is this local hazard data and understanding tail risk is really important. And so when you're thinking, you know, I couldn't agree more, I think stress tests are, are a good step forward, but they're top-down scenarios. We also need bottom-up and understanding cascading risk better. So, hotter summers in the UK and wetter, warmer winters, which we've just had. So, you know, that I'd like to finish by just saying I think this cross-disciplinary that we're doing now, which we did in mitigation, God, change. When did we start? 20 years ago, unfortunately. You know, we need to do it in adaptation now. And I've been doing mitigation for 25 years. I'm now saying to everyone, you have to speed up mitigation. You have to achieve net zero quicker in the next decade. But we have to adapt. And that, I guess, is from me in the finance sector, is a risk, but it's also an investment opportunity because we've got to find the solutions to invest. I, I think I would just conclude by saying I'm, I'm, I'm fairly new to this kind of sort of community. Um, but what I think there is, there's, I'm really keen here that, that we can sort of try and work together, bring some more, more of the, the climate science uh, pull through to work together and, and make some progress in here. There's, there's clearly the, you know, massive challenges we need to address, but, but I'm, I'm hopeful we can make progress here. Yeah, I completely echo that. We, we need lots of more in the interdisciplinary work, um, working together on these things. And um, just to say that I think um, the point about uncertainty is really important and that often when you're trying to manage uncertainty that mo models are not always the answer. But this is, this is known by people working fi finance um, already where you use scenarios instead and that, that's going to be a key part of this. Um, and then just maybe finally, just to say, talk about tipping points, talk about tipping points in um, the climate system and in the economic system, but there's also tipping points in the social system. And when you look at how societies change, it doesn't happen in a straight line. So it's, this is a, a, something to always bear in mind. So you may not see much change. The change, rate of change may be very slow, but we cannot project that into the future and say it will always be slow. So if we keep, keep working on these things, you know, Societies can change very quickly. So, Jason, the last word to you. I'm, I'm not sure if this is an appropriate last word, but <laughs> we've talked a lot about uncertainty. There are some things that we are much more certain of on now. I mean, we are certain on being able to detect the climate change signal. So we're not, we're not sitting here now talking about climate change as something in the future. Climate change is something that we can actually go out um, and measure and see the, the human fingerprint on. We're also uh, not uncertain about the fact that we are locked into some change already. So even with very strong mitigation, there will be some change that we have to adapt to or deal with in, in some way. Um, and while there's uncertainty around the magnitude, the fact that that is now locked in is, is not an uncertainty in my view. So, uh challenging but but great way to uh to end so thank you so much thank you matt and looking forward to uh